Hopefully everything is well with all of you out there and we are of course at the special occasion or location that I mentioned before which is in Rancho Santa Margarita and as you can see from behind me with this beautiful dash display we are at Race Pack. Great team here. Hello SoCal Dotson. Hello Alfie. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Hello everyone. Wow 38 so far in a few seconds. Hello Dolph. Hello BS. Hello Doctor. Good seeing you guys. I'm actually downloading right now as you speak the Anchor app which I use to transfer this to a podcast after we're done. Hello Helian. Hello SoCal. Travis, good seeing you brother. Good seeing you as well. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Appreciate all of that. Hello JDM. Hello JH. Wow, and for those of you who are on YouTube, I am using this opportunity to interact with fans all across the world on Instagram Live. And we're here at this wonderful facility in Rancho Santa Margarita, Race Pack. Really great guys. And that being said, something I'm really excited about is this new Vantage CL1. This is a really cool device that really does a great job in combining the power of mobile technology with data acquisition abilities for you to remotely see what's going on with your race car, allow you to get tons of data acquisition, combine it with many different types of sensors and it does a great job and allow you to be a better driver and a better racer. Um, no plans for opening up a store in Italy as we speak now. Hello Sayal, hello Storm, hello ARZ, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Hello Hedy, good seeing you. Hello DA9RS. So guys, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon, really appreciate that. And many of you had the opportunity to send in questions, which is pretty, pretty cool. And those questions we will answer. Of course, as you can see here, I have Ari right there. There she is waving. And she's going to join us this afternoon by sharing all the cool questions you guys answered. And I also have the opportunity to share live what's going on and have a good time. So I'm going to try and see if I can connect with my anchor. And hopefully that gives me the opportunity to do something very clever and record this podcast so you guys can listen to it afterwards. Ari, I see uh, that Alfie says hi. Yes. Hello, Namo. Hi, Alfie. Good seeing you. As you can hear, she said hello. And let's see. Okay, I think we are up. So I'm going to go ahead and set up this record button. And I believe now, allow. Okay. And I'm going to start recording. Here we go. So now my anchor is up. That way, happy Tuesday to you, that Joy, that Joe guy. Thank you so much. Hello, Ari, again. That will allow me to upload this later on so you can listen to it on iTunes, on public radio, on Anchor itself, under BC Moto, Tech Tuesday. You can't miss it. Just do a search for BC Moto, you'll see it. And if you're working out, jogging, walking your dog, doing whatever, you don't have to look at this live. You have the opportunity to listen at your convenience. Okay, so without further ado, Ari, what questions do we have today that were sent in? All right, our first question is from Hussein177. Hussein177. He wants to know if we have anything for a 2014 Carrera 2. So, a 2014 C2 Carrera is what he has, and I don't have anything yet, but we have a great partnership with our, our friends from McKenna Porsche, and I plan on getting one of those vehicles in to design an exhaust pulse chamber system that's been extremely popular with the air-cooled engine. So that being said, hang tight. Before the end of the third quarter, we'll have something very nice. I'm doing well, EJ. Hopefully, you're doing just smashingly well as well. What else do we have, Ari? We have a good question from Dippin Deep One. Dippin Deep One, pretty cool screen name there. It is. I was wondering if I put 91 octane in my Odyssey, will I gain any horsepower advantages or gas mileages if the factory ECU calls for 87 or 88? So he's asking if his vehicle, and this applies to all vehicles out there that run on commercially available street fuel, if the vehicle is set up for 89 or 87 octane, is there any advantage, any performance advantage of running at 91 or higher octane? That's a very common question and there's some misunderstandings there. Because you think of octane or its capability to ward away detonation, having the opportunity to be more anti-knock capable, people think automatically it creates more power. Without an oxygen in it, which most 91 fuels don't have, you can't see many power gains, if at all. As a matter of fact, you may see a loss in power. Because when manufacturers, and even tuners like myself, tune a car on 87 or, or 89 or even 91, we optimize ignition timing for those fuels. By adding a higher octane or slower burning fuel, you now don't have the ideal pressure of combustion doing work on the piston. And what that translates is you can lose power. So for your Odyssey, adding 91 octane will not give you any performance benefit. If anything, it can make you lose power. 
Stay with the more cost-effective 87 or 89 that was built for or designed for, and you'll be fine. Once again, running a higher octane fuel when the vehicle or engine was not tuned for it can have you in a situation where you lose power. So I hope that helps. Okay, what is Ari? We have a really good question from Adam Bendov. Adam Bendov has a good question. Would using a Cayman instead of a Boxster or any Coupe versus Roadster in general as a base car for a build have any benefit in torso rigidity or would they be about the same once the cage is put in? So he's asking, and I'm sure this has to do with what we built, he's asking if you start with a, a convertible or a Coupe, is there any advantage with rigidity of the chassis after a cage is put in? Is there any advantage? And based on my experience, no. If anything, you can have an opportunity to have a lighter chassis with a convertible than you may with a coupe. And I, I saw that with our own boxman, where we used a 96 boxer as a base. Not only are those chassis a lot more plentiful and more cost effective, when you take all the roof and reinforcement of the chassis out, it becomes a very lightweight chassis, lighter than a Cayman. And then I incorporated that with a carbon fiber roof, it was absolutely bliss. And then with the cage that ties in all the major points, the structure integrity is ideal. Now that's what I've seen with that kind of platform, especially if they're very similar in nature. So after the cage is put in, no, there is no rigid or rigidity advantages. Now if you leave it as a unibody chassis or use a very simple four point cage or cage that doesn't tie in many points, then of course the coupe would be more rigid and better, which is very nice. Carrie Del Delman is asking, what about a mixture of racing fuel with 91 octane fuel? Once again, it depends. Now, if you mix those fuels and then tune your car to optimize that fuel octane rating, since that combination will burn slower, if you optimize it, then yes. But if you do not, if you have an opportunity where your vehicle is optimized on 91 and then you mix a race fuel on top of it and leave the ignition timing alone, it won't be a benefit. Even worse, if the race fuel you're adding has an oxygen in it and you need to richen up the mixture more, you can do more than lose power, you can hurt the engine. So ideally, the name of the game is you need to have your fuel matched up with the tuning capability of your engine. So I hope that works. E5 versus 91 octane, both pump advantages. Well, guess what? When you combine, compare E85 to 93 octane, the E85 as a fuel has more caloric content in it than you would see with 91 octane with regular hydrocarbon-based gasoline. Because of that, when you burn the same amount of air that your engine can ingest, you create more heat, which creates more power. So remember, in some of my old Tech Tuesdays, I've shared this, engines are nothing but glorified energy converters. So you have the chemical energy contained in the fuel, in this case, 85 or 91 octane, and the oxygen contained in air, which is about 20%. Then you combust it using a spark plug, and we're talking about regular internal combustion engines, not diesels, you have a spark plug ignited, that energy that's then created, that heat, then does work on a piston, which that now chemical energy is turned to heat energy, which is then converted to mechanical energy when the heat does work on the piston top. And then that piston top is com converted to a crankshaft, which takes that up and down mention and turns to rotational energy, which is pretty nice. So you now have that opportunity. So back to your E85. Based on my experience, we've seen anywhere from five to 8% improvement in power on a naturally aspirated engine, which is very nice, and some little bit more advantages with boosted engines because it's out of its anti-knock capability. So you will see more power with E85 versus what you may see with 91 octane. So I hope that helps. Thank you so much. Okay, what else do we have, Ari? These next couple of questions are referring to um, the post, the picture. Okay, so the photo. Okay, yes, the photo. so I put up that pretty cool photo today of a Beast Motor inspired render. But what do we have so far? Uh, let's see, 2013 Kurt wants okay. to know, is there a particular reason as to why you have them to mount the turbos in that fashion? Yes, there is. So, as you see most of my projects, I have the turbos in the rear. There are many advantages to that. Well, let's start about the initial influence for me. Drag racing. So, when I got into motorsports, I was a hardcore drag racer. Still love drag racing very much, but I've expanded quite a bit into road racing. And the name of the game is adhesion. You want to be able to hook up on the track. Many of you have seen what happens when you don't hook up on my most recent Netflix episode. When you don't hook up, you don't go anywhere. But as a drug racer, I understand the need for adhesion. So that being said, what is a great way to put more adhesion to a real wheel drive, rear engine, or RR setup? By putting up more weight as possible rearward. So when you launch and physics is in your favor and you hook up, you go forward. So, 
since I have these devices, these turbochargers that have decent amount of mass, and I don't want to confine it to underneath the vehicle where there's a significant amount of heat that can be generated and continue to do things that are not very positive, I'd love to be able to have an opportunity where the turbos can cool down, especially the cartridges, and also take advantage of the weight advantages of putting it towards the rear of the car. And above and beyond that, it's a great way to really showcase the engineering that goes into the, build, into the builds. And the cool thing is that you can always put the bumper covers back on there, which is pretty nice. So I do that primarily because of my background in drag racing and I love adhesion and being able to hook up, which is very nice. And now it's been very popular with our builds. It spawned a lot of imitators out there who like to copy what we've done. But it's been fantastic. It's been really good and it looks really, really, really cool, you must admit. So I hope that gives you some insight on why we place turbos in the rear of the car. Okay, next question comes from Al Press. Al Press, okay. Couldn't you work a functional diffuser into or around the turbo setup? Could also add extra cooling effect as well. Well, to answer your first question, I could add a diffuser, but it could be quite invasive because as you see where the turbos are, it doesn't leave much real estate for the bottom to put a diffuser. And the diffuser can help really with a lot of aero pulling the vehicle down. In the cooling aspect, I would disagree, only because you are now shielding the turbo from radiation of heat. And you can have an opportunity where the cartridges won't be very happy with a lot of heat that can be generated there. It also can put a position where it can start melting stuff, even the diffuser itself. So there is a balancing act there between what I want in terms of power, cooling efficiency, and also taking advantage of a diffuser. So I've given that much consideration, but real estate is an issue, and cooling of the cartridges is also an issue as well. Okay, next question comes from Nyla Mystery. Nyla Mystery. Does it spit anti-lag flames? Okay, so <laughs> does, the, does the render spit anti-lag flames? Well, that is a rendering of a 991 setup. So that being said, it's not a vehicle that is actually existing. Even though it looks like a, something very photorealistic, it's not a real car. That's a render of a BC Motor inspired 991. As any setup that I put together, yes, the capability of anti-lag flames are there. An anti-lag is a situation where we literally retard timing, add fuel, and give the opportunity for combustion in the turbine of the turbo to allow for a quick spool up of the turbo, especially the turbo is much larger. So it's so weird, Nila is asking exactly what anti-lag is, I just explained it. So it's once again, it is the concept where we retard timing and add fuel to retard the combustion event into the turbine. And when that happens in the turbine, not only see, you see the flames, it spools the turbo very quickly and makes a large turbo act like a much smaller one. Now, because turbines weren't designed for combustion, it's very hard on turbos. So that being said, it's very, very hard. On turbos, on cartridges, on bearings, it's tough. But it's something that you can use with much success, but I always advise my customers to use it sporadically, not something you do all the time, which is pretty interesting. Um, twin charge, yes, I would love to be able to combine the opportunities of a turbocharger and also a supercharger, but I haven't quite identified what project would be cool for that yet. It's Your pretty friends. nice. My mom's called. Um, yes. Okay. So that being said, what else do we have, Ari? Okay, um, you pretty much answered Rom Tom um, oh. question because he, okay. he asked who's the owner of the car. Oh, okay, okay. so it's, it's, a, it's a render. Yes, okay, yes. so our next question could be from B Dub Pat. Okay, B Dub Pat. What does that rear bumper do for overall coefficients of drag versus stock form? So that's a great question. So, what I've noticed, and I saw this quite a bit on the air cooled Porsches that we put together, is there are these weird balloon effects that occur with some of these older Porsches where there's nothing underneath the vehicle to prevent air from getting trapped into the bumper cover. So when I started these projects, I did a lot of it with the air-cooled engines, my air-cooled chassis, and that was actually a benefit. Even on some of my drag cars, when we use the base drag vehicles available from the manufacturer, something that's commercially available, something that is road-worthy, we notice this crazy balloon effect that happens, and when we cut open or influence or put holes or create some kind of plate underneath. Our mile hours go up, our times get better. So that being said, from an aerodynamic standpoint, what I have done with those turbos is a huge advantage. Now, if we ever have a project car where there's significant opportunities for flat plating or flat bottoming that extends all the way to the rear or built-in diffusers, then doing that could be a bit of a detriment. But for every car that I've done it for, 100% of them have a weird balloon effect where this did help it. So I hope that answers your question properly. Awesome. Okay, Evan BMX okay. is asking. Hello, Basile. I love your design, by the way. That red one, I'm gonna post it up in a few days. 
very clever. And I see what you did there. It's very clever. But I'm sure we'll get tons of questions about the feasibility of something like that with the turbos in the front and the rear end. It's going to be pretty interesting. But mm -hmm. go ahead, Ari. Okay. Uh, with an exhaust that short, does yes. no back pressure affect the performance of the turbos at all? Yes, positively. So they're asking with... <clears throat> Most of my trouble setups, the race stuff, the crazy old school stuff that we have that's pre-smog, I don't have much of anything in terms of piping, mufflers, long exhaust systems, small apertures. None of that occurs. So doesn't that affect it? Yes, it does, positively. Once again, think about the analogy I gave earlier about engines being glorified heat exchangers uh, or glorified energy converters. If you think about what a turbocharger does, about how it takes wasted energy of heat and mass flow rate in the exhaust and is directly cogged to another wheel in the compressor that helps compress the gases to push into the engine to create power because the way to create power is to get as much engine or engine or oxygen in the engine with the appropriate amount of fuel. If you think about that, there is a great opportunity to make power here and the turbocharger is there to help create that opportunity. Hello, Sam. Having a restrictive exhaust on a turbocharger does two things. It creates back pressure, which is very poor in allowing the spool up, proper spool up of the turbine itself. And secondly, it takes energy, yes, energy to push the exhaust out, which is a very big challenge in terms of creating reliable power. And above and beyond that, during camshaft overlap, ideally you want a clean mixture for that intake stroke. With a lot of back pressure, that can back that up all the way into the combustion chamber area and what happens is you cannot take full advantage of any scavenging effects that can occur at overlap, which means you now have a slightly contaminated intake charge, which reduces power potential. So you will see many of my cells and some even hardcore races out there and drag races where they have a very short and very unrestrictive exhaust system. 100% of the time, there's a huge benefit to that. So I hope that I asked your question properly. Yes, it does affect it positively, which is always great. Whenever you have resistance in, the, in front of it, you have opportunities where you don't have much power for much flow. Hello, sir. Okay. okay, I see Carrie Delimon is asking, are there any really advantages of power gains with stock ECU? And you had power flow intake and headers and the ECU will compensate and give power to a certain degree, of course. Well, yes, with a factory ECU, there are limitations because each manufacturer has ranges in terms of what the ECU can correct for for fuel. Most ignition timing is fixed with exception of if there's a challenge where, let's say knock comes into play. The ECU can automatically retard timing, which is to help in power. So that being said, there are opportunities where you can add camshafts, do exhaust systems, and see some gains in power. But if you do optimally tune that setup, you can get more power than normal, which is pretty nice. Oh, yes, and very loud book, I say. Absolutely. I love it too. OK. Yes, sorry. Let's get to Basil Design's question since he's here. Okay, Basil Design. Um, car sounds are subjective, mm -hmm. but so few like the sound of a VQ. Yet a V6 from an NSX sounds subjectively good. How can a VQ make a sound more like the NSX? I'm talking about the old one, by the way. Okay, well, it has to do with so many comp components, but what is very, very critical, it's so strange, head design, angle of the V, all that makes a big difference. So. To make a VQ sound exactly like an old school C series is very possible but also very cost prohibitive. In my opinion, we all can enjoy. Oh, they said they can't hear Ari very well. But so, what I'll do, guys, since you guys can hear Ari, I'll repeat some more questions and we should be okay. Right? So, that being said, the opportunities exist in being able to play and take advantage of the natural frequencies that occur with an engine and try and make things. Uh, more appealing to your ears to be, you know, music, exhaust tones are like music. Some people like it loud, some people like it soft, some people like it harsh. It depends. So to make one sound exactly like the other can be done, but it can be very expensive to do. It's better to try and take advantage of what you have currently available and optimize it accordingly. So I hope that, I hope that helps. Oh, thank you, Basile. He says exactly. Okay. Okay. Question from Dip and Deep One. Dip and Deep One has a question. Do you warm up your daily cars making sure it's an open loop before driving? Or open do you, loop, huh? Or do you just go since there's not enough time in the day for you? So he's asking um, if I start my car, do I wait for it to go in open loop before driving? So that being said, 
um, that's very interesting because when you start up your car, let's I assume you're talking about internal combustion engines with fuel injection. When you start up the car, it starts up in open loop, and then depending on the protocol defined by the manufacturer, it goes to closed loop very quickly or not so quickly. So to answer your question, I don't start it up and wait for it to go into closed loop, and closed loop is where the wideband sensor monitors air fuel ratios and corrects to what's ideal. Um, I start my car and I drive off. And even with vehicles that we prep for the track where we have an engine management solution like an Infinity, um, we make sure that in open loop when you start the car, it's rich enough and safe enough to allow you to take off immediately. And then after literally, I think I have it in four seconds, closed loop comes on board. So I don't have to wait for it to warm up or do anything of that nature. You can definitely drive your car properly. Not crazy racing because, you know, you don't want to do that. You want a car to warm up before you start mashing out on it but you can do that with great success. I see S2 is asking, pure oil, is it worth it? Absolutely. So the one thing that people don't understand is that oil is not a commodity. It's not something that just doesn't make a difference. They're not all created equally. And what I want to do, what I would do, because I'm getting a lot of the same questions a lot, is in the next few days, I may just put together a small class and seminar on oils and have you guys come in and, and take a look and ask questions because what I can, the seminar I can put together will give a very good understanding of what the different oils are, what's synthetic, what's mineral, and under synthetics, what's a group three, what's a group four, what's, what's a group five, what are the advantages of each one. And the one thing about pure oil is that it has an opportunity to be a combination of group four and group five, which are the higher upper echelon of oils. And because of that, in addition to the additive package, you see better cooling, you see improved gas mileage because the friction reduction is absolutely superb. These guys come from aerospace and they do a lot more heat and friction than we do in cars. And above and beyond that, it gives nice power gains while protecting with a very high amount of zinc, appropriate amount of zinc, about 1,770 or 1,750 parts per million of zinc, which compare that to, let's say, something you may see in a regular store has 800 parts per million, which is not very good protection for a lot of our overhead cam um, engines. Josh is laughing and asking, do Porsches go fast like Mustangs? Um, most modern day Porsches are much faster whether you're looking at the uh, 5.0 or you're looking at the EcoBoost, by all means. Okay, have a great day as well, JDM, enjoy. Thank you so much, thank you. Um, so, yes it would, it's not mine, but we do sell it. Um, it worked very well for Datsuns, both classic and not so classic, for original engines or rebuilt, by all means. And I think you will see uh, most Datsun guys use engines from 530 to 2050, depending on the build. So I hope that helps. And I think, I, yeah, I think we still have them on sale now for like $14, which is pretty nice opposed to what you may see online. I think they have it on Amazon for like $21, you know, so on and so forth. Um, Boca is asking, water meth injection, is it worth the money? Absolutely, it is. So the ability to, to ward away detonation is so key, and you can get away with higher boost levels on boosted cars. You can get away with a lot more, uh, uh, you can have more efficient time to create more power. And on natural aspirated setups, you can have very good anti-knock capability and making more power. So that being said, the water methanol kit, what I like to do is, I don't use rubbish methanol, I use good lab grade methanol at a 50-50 mixture with deionized water, and I combine it, and then I think the blue Porsche that I have, I don't have that shirt on today, but the blue Porsche that I play with, I definitely use that. I think I have two nozzles, I think 500 cc's each, and it is a lifesaver. It allows me to easily go to any gas station, put in 91, and then when I'm in boost, it, has, it does a great job in not just dumping the mixture, but having a, how should I say, a variable increase from little to more. It's like a, a, a very nice discharge that is not linear. Oh, that, I'm sorry, that is linear and not just a dump, which is very nice. So it's, it's regulated very nicely and it, it does wonderful things. And not only does it have the capability of warding away detonation because of its methanol component, but also does a great job in cooling, which is really, really cool. Um, so Boca, it depends, he's asking water methanol versus switching to E85 for turbo. It depends. If you have an opportunity where E85 is really available for you, it's, it's a, it's a no-brainer. E85 is really, really good. Um, if it's something where you have an opportunity to only have E85 very sparsely, water methanol is a very, very good way to go. And for me, and I drive crazy, I go through like a gallon of that mixture in like a three-week period, driving daily, driving crazy, which is pretty cool, you know. Uh, 92 DARS says, Pure saved the motor on one of my customer's cars on the track where there was an issue that caused oil temps to spike of 100. 
um, he could get off the track just over. Oh, good, good. So I'm glad to hear that. As I said, the guys who manufacture pure oil, aerospace guys, they sell a lot more heat and friction that you typically can see. I'm coming. Um, that you typically see. So I'm here, clients are coming in and it's just great. They're very busy here at Race Pack, which is very nice. Um, so yes, you can use it with great success. It has very high chemical and heat resilience, which I'm not surprised, but very good. Um, S2, definitely precision. Um, the Garrett stuff is really good. They have very good OEM affiliations, but precision guys are hardcore enthusiasts. If you're racing and you're not an OEM, <laughs> I love the precision stuff. Precision, Turbinex, those two partners, are my favorites. Very good company. And you know what's cool about Precision and Turbinex? If you need something unique, they can make it for you. Yes, they will bend over backwards to make something custom just for your application. You won't see that with the other brand, which is pretty good. You know. Um, no two-stroke oil, SoCal. Not at this time. Not at this time. And it's, once again, it's not my oil. <laughs> it's a company that I partner with. Um, so what system is used for method injection? So AEM does have their own controller that comes with their kit. And you could use it for pretty much any ECU engine management solution that has a ground input. And what that ground input is there for is for a fail safe. So if you have a problem with a controller, if your pump is clogged, if your tank is empty, it has a fail safe that will send a ground output out, which then in turn you can put your ECU as a boost cut, a rev limit, a warning light, anything of that nature, which is pretty cool. Yeah. My pleasure, S2. My pleasure indeed. How are we doing questions so far, Ari? We are good. We have a good question from Mongoose08. Mongoose08 has a question. I'm interested in building an 06 through a 09 987 Boxster okay. or Cayman. Okay. Power goals are four to 500 wheel horsepower okay. for a very fun street car as okay. my S2K has become predominantly a track car. Okay. Would you recommend the 2.9 liter base motor or the 3.4 that comes in the S model? I have also heard you mention several times a possible BC Turbo kit. Yes, so to answer your question, yes, definitely 3.4. The 3.4 is vastly superior than the 2.9. I would highly encourage you to use the one from the S. 3.4 is superior. The valve train is absolutely fantastic. The camshafts are more robust. And you can get closer very easily to your 400 goal. Now, if you want to do 500 crank, no problem. If you want to do 500 wheel, you have to build an engine for longevity and reliability. So I hope that helps. And yes, our kit, we do have it slated for the third quarter of this year. I don't just put stuff out when it's just made. We're trying to get as much data as possible to make sure that when you have it, it is great. And just check with your local uh, um, laws and whatever you can do in your area because this kit is not one for use on highways where police control vehicles are an issue, like in California. In California, people offer use only, but if you're allowed in your area to have a kit like that, no problem whatsoever. But we want it to be reliable for you, indeed. Sounds good. Thank you, Boca. And if you need help with the Watermet kit, just Ari can give you a good deal, give her a call, and maybe she can help you out, get something very nice, either for the single gallon or five gallon size, which is pretty nice, you know? Um, oh, good. You will be very pleased as to, you'll be very pleased indeed. So I look forward to you upgrading to Pure and let me know about it. And if you need some, we have them in stock. Okay. We have another question from Dippin' Deep One. Dippin' Deep One has another question. <laughs> Is it smart to put my Odyssey or any car in drive and let it roll at an idle to warm up the car? Or would that be bad on the engine versus leaving it in park until open loop? So once again, when you start your car, it is an open loop. If you mean closed loop, you don't have to do that. Honda does a great job in being able to design their protocol for the engines to allow you to start the car and in a few seconds is an open loop to allow for a nice warm-up protocol in the ECU and it puts you in closed loop. You don't have to do anything funny, just start your car up, put it in drive and drive normally and you'll be fine. So I hope that helps. Um, 944 turbos, I think they're one of the most underrated cars out there. I like them very much, I love the shape. 944s probably are going to be very sought after in the next decade or so. So I think that's absolutely fantastic. Uh, hello, so the card is saying hello to Ari and BC. Hi. Hello. So Rinkara, this shirt you can get online at the BC Motor Web Store. I believe um, we have some more in, but I have to put up on don't we? Yeah. Yeah. We so do we do have them in stock. And if you have a hard time getting on the website, call in to 888-922-6686, which is the BC Motor uh, phone line. And Ari would be more than happy to help you. We have medium, large, extra large. I think that's what we have so far. Two. I think we and two, two X. X. She says two X. Maybe, maybe not. But let us know. We can take it. Ah, greetings from Moscow as well. Good seeing you. Hello, Samuel. Hello, ESS. Um, turbo with a non-turbo rear end. Ugh, I don't know because I haven't evaluated the strength or integrity of the non-turbo rear end. 
and knowing Portia, they may have built them very differently. So, I don't know yet. I don't know. I don't have the answer for you. Okay, how are we doing so far? Great, great. Beautiful. Okay, we have um, Jacob McGrath, 68. Has, Jacob McGrath. He has a question referring to your post again, the okay. picture. Okay, okay. Um, how do you feel about an arrow kit on the back to better balance the car, or is it already balanced well? I know Porsches can be a bit tricky with the width and distribution since the engine is in the rear. Well, in this case, for the vehicle that we put up there, um, aero, we, I, just, I actually addressed a little bit with the diffuser, being that putting a diffuser is difficult because of lack of real estate there. Wings and the split in the front do a great job in balancing the vehicle very nicely, getting extra aero advantages at the expense of heat dissipation and engine failure because of extra heat could be a challenge. So I take a stepwise approach to experimenting. Even on the crazy box we have, I have some people ask me, hey BC, what's going on with the front wheels? I'm playing with track because I want to see what's optimized for that setup. I'm putting different drivers in the car to get feedback to know how to improve and make it a perfect track vehicle. It's the same thing with rear diffusion. I need to be able to get as much data as possible as is. We have great cooling, great opportunities for longevity with a cartridge of a turbo, and good balance in terms of how the engine sits and the vehicle adheres to the tarmac in high boost applications. But when it comes to diffusers, any advantages there is something that we have to play with and get some feedback. So stay tuned. Right now, it'll be left as is. Um, I don't have any experience with the 991.2 block art. Um, and when I do, I'll be more than happy to share that here. But right now, I have not played with those yet. You know. Um, so Samuel has a, has a question. He has a 1.6 Focus MK, not ST. Should he upgrade to a 2.0? Absolutely, if you can. If you can do it, do it. You'll be very pleased with the power output of that, especially with the head design. You know, um, Button Wheel I've only been there once, uh, which is nice. My first time out, I'm learning as a driver, and at that point, I did like a two or three, which is pretty interesting. First time out, first time on that track, and it's a very technical track. I like that track a lot, which is pretty nice. My pleasure, Art. My pleasure indeed. So how are we doing so far? We have two more questions. Okay, left. sounds good. Two okay. more questions. Mm -hmm. I can answer yours, and I'll bring a very good guest here as well to talk a little bit about. What is going on here at this wonderful facility? Hello, Pro Billa. Okay, this question comes from F. L. Boo. F. L. Boo. Okay. okay. If you had the chance to build a track 350Z, yes. okay. what engine would you choose oh, and why? That's easy. Um, I'd use a VQ from the Skyline. Um, only because those engines are quite robust. People make tons of power with it. It has a great sound. It sounds like my Odyssey, actually. <laughs> so that's what I would do. Um, I love how the Zs look. And it doesn't have that really crazy wet shape. And please don't kill me, guys, who love Skylines and GTRs. But that wet shape is a bit much. I love the lines of the Z. It almost looks very Porsche-like. But I love the engine, the powertrain, on drivetrain of the GTR. So a VQ, Skyline GTR base application would be my choice. And I like keeping engines with, with marquees as well. So I like to keep Nissans with Nissans and so on and so forth. You know? Um, I should have taken a different car. What are you speaking of? F Y F Y F Y F Y N Y N. I don't know what you're speaking of. I have so many vehicles. Taking a different car to Button Willow to Netflix to. You have to let me know. Okay. Thank you, SoCal. Yes. And what's the final question we okay, have? Okay. Our last question is from Ryan. Oh, Ryan. Ryan. Okay. Okay. He is doing an '82 Porsche swap. '82 Porsche. Okay. Air -cooled. Thoughts on what is best? What's the best engine choice? Okay. 996 and a build. Okay. Panor uh, Panamera. I'm sorry. V8. Okay. And a build or a Synergy V8 crate engine. Okay. So I just mentioned a moment ago. I love keeping marquees with other ch with chassis. So. I'd love for you to, you know, I'd love to see you stay with the Porsche marquee instead of doing something with Synergy. So that being said, I would say 996 NA. That's too easy. For great fanfare, I would say Panamera or a V8 from the Cayano. That would be sick. Hasn't been done. I'm very confident that you can do that with great success and it'll get you a lot of attention. It's just a very, very possible setup. So he's saying you meant a different car to a fastest car. No, so uh, I'll, go over, I go, I'll go over this every Tech Tuesday. Mm -hmm. So to ask you a question, we submitted the blue Porsche that makes 850 wheel and our crazy thousand horsepower rear wheel drive converted Santa Fe that we do with Hyundai. So that being said, we submitted those, they came to inspect it and they saw the van in my showroom. and like. What is that? I tell about the van, like, we want this. So that van is very powerful. That van is very fast. 
But when you combine it and you're asked to use street tires and you race against guys with slicks that are rural drive, you can see the result. I spun every gear throughout the entire time. Um, it wasn't fair, but I take full responsibility. I should have taken slicks with me, even though I was told not to. So I do tend to obey rules. I've always done it in my driver's career, still do it to today, but we were asked to run street tires and pump gas. And that's what I did, but my competitors didn't do that. So that's the result. Take full responsibility. It's my fault, but I had a good time filming it, and my crew did as well. My family and crew had a great time with that. So thank you so much. Thank you, IFSO. Good seeing you. Okay. So that being said, as I mentioned earlier today, guys, I'm in this wonderful facility here in Rancho Santa Margarita. I'm with my friends from Race Pack. I have this wonderful Vantage CL1 here, which is a great device. I have it in my Boxman, which has helped me tremendously become a better driver. It really combines the technology and advantages of modern day mobile devices with the ability to see excellent data acquisition using external sensors or what you may have on board, which is very exciting. And you know what's really cool? You can upload all that data to cloud and your friends and teammates can view what you're doing on the track real time. It's so awesome. I just put my phone right there on my dash. I can see what's going on. It's absolutely spectacular. So, that being said, we're at Race Pack, and I want to bring someone on board. I don't know if, if Tim is available, but I'd love for, Tim is a uh, president here at, at Race Pack, and I'd love for him to share with all of you so much information about um, uh, what they have new, a little bit more with the CO1. See, Perez, hang tight. I'll have, I will take Tim's thunder. I'll have him share with you how much this is. Um, my pleasure, Samuel. Thank you so much. I'm here to help. So, the moment I grab that chair here, I'm going to move to the side. I had a call come in, so I can't really see what you guys see. So I need to count on you to let me know what you see. And if Tim needs to move over some more. So I'm going to grab this chair over here. So Tim, why don't you sit here and join me? Really close. Yes, yes, very close. <laughs> so guys, this is Tim. And oh, by Art. Good seeing you. My pleasure. My pleasure. So um, I have a, we have a question. I was talking a little bit about the CO1 here. And when someone tracks, I see Rinkara is asking, can we view data with the Vantage CO1? Yes, I was trying to read it. How do you read that? Oh, I'm, uh, I have great eyesight. I have to look over top. I can read it over top of my glasses. Um, <laughs> yes, because it's stream, it uses a phone. Yes. That's connected to the box by Bluetooth. I'm trying to figure out exactly where the camera is. Oh, no worries. <laughs> so the phone itself is a data recorder. Oh, there you go. Where so you the go? phone itself is a data recorder. So since we're using the phone as a data recorder, we're also using the cellular capabilities of the phone to send information to the server. Uh -huh. So then it's not only saving it to the server, but it can re be remotely accessed by anyone that's part of your team that you sign up on your team so they can see your data anytime, anywhere. Very nice. Yeah. Oh, and uh, so Kyle Dotson says, what's up, Tim? And we had a question from, let's see here, C. Perez R35. He's asking how much is the Vantage CO1? 595. 595. Oh, said awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah, so $595, you get all that capability. And like I said, it takes the power of the mobile device and combines that with excellent data acquisition, which is so spectacular. You can use it on your, I think we can still use it on the iPhone. You use an iPhone, iPhone and Android, Android devices. Yep, yeah, either one. And, and it's something that we've wanted to do for years. And it's, it was not an easy process to make this work. The, Kind of the funny thing about it, and we've talked about this before, is the when people use it, it's like, oh yeah, this is cool. Well, because it mimics a lot of the actions of, of tablets and smartphones, the swipe and all that stuff, then customers just kind of take it as, well, yeah, it should work like that. What they don't see is what it took behind the scenes in the four years and a lot of money to actually make this thing work. It's very effortless when you use it, and they're just like, well, yeah, it should do that. Well, yeah, it, it does after a lot of money and a lot of time. <laughs> and, and it works very, very well because we've spoken about it before. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel and build a box that has cell service and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and all this crazy stuff and then have to have that connected to this. It's like, why not just use a phone? Phones are very clever. Phones are, are uh, much better than what we would have built anyhow. I'm not going to lie about it. We can't outthink Apple. <laughs> we, don't, we don't have the people or the money or the anything to do that. Yeah, so Fox said thumb up. Yeah, yeah, so what Tim is saying is exactly correct. Being able to use the power of mobile devices with all the research and development that goes into that. Hello, Dover, Turbo Fever. That is the way to go. And they've taken advantage of that, combining their knowledge with racing with the power of mobile devices and current technology, which is absolutely fantastic. Tim, are you able to share anything exciting coming from Race Pack that 
our fans may be excited or may want to know about? That I can talk about? That you can talk about? No. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so guys, you're not trying to get the scoop in. I tried there, to. Oh, good thing you see Perez. Thank you. There is. I mean, obviously, we, we always have things, uh, you know, in the hopper, so to speak. But there's a couple of products we're working on that's going to be. One of them is really, really cool. I wish I could talk about it. We may have it out at SEMA. One, oh. I think, one I think we'll have at SEMA. I'm not sure about the other. I really want to show it because it's it's light years beyond anything that we've ever done and a lot of other people are doing in terms of track day cars and that type of stuff and circuit racing and all that. Um, because what we're trying to what we're trying to do, and I, I think instead of having this disjointed suite of products that don't make sense and everything, what we're trying to look at in the future is how is everything integrated? Because if you think about, and I'll go back to the same thing, you go back to Apple and all that, you go, well, when you think about how they went through the development process, what they really did was to build a platform and they just glued things onto it iPods right. and what were the, the nano, I don't know, <laughs> and all those things. But the, to make it all work, Steve Jobs is smart enough to go, the platform is iTunes, the platform is all that stuff. And that's what made it work. And once he, once he had all that working, then he could just keep adding devices. Of so course. he comes out with the iPhone and it just keeps going down the line. So for us, we have to build a platform that allows us to add to that and not have a bunch of disjointed products that don't make sense to customers. So like in the case of this thing, it uses a D3 app. Um, and one of the things we're very careful about when we talk about the app, the first thing people assume is, oh, it's, it's an app in the phone, so it's using phone sensors. No, it doesn't use any phone sensors because this has GPS and all the external sensors input. And it'll also plug in OBD2 or about 15 aftermarket, 15 or 20 aftermarket EFIs, like in your cards, it's plugged into AEM which yeah, I don't have a problem saying that. <laughs> so um, that's kind of the cool thing about it. So it's a platform for a lot of different inputs and stuff. But more than anything, like I said, is how do we move down the road with this? How do we integrate it in with future products and all that? So once you understand the cloud side of things and how to move things around and allow people to access data from anywhere in the world, because that's your expectations, I'll go back to the same idea with iTunes and your music. You should be able to get to your music on your iPad, on an airplane, or on your phone driving on the highway. And that's what we want this to be. So the app itself, like I said, the D3 app functions really as three things. It turns the phone into the data logger. In other words, you program all the sensor inputs on the phone, pointing in my lap because my phone's in my pocket. <laughs> um, it's instrumentation for the driver. So it's smart enough to know that when you're sitting there and nothing's on, the box goes to sleep. When you start the engine, the box wakes up from the tax signal, the phone wakes up, or the box wakes the phone up and the phone presents a pit dash, which shows all your sensor inputs, the live data, so you know, yeah, yeah, everything's working. When you start moving, as you've noticed, it brings up predictive lap time, lap number, Absolutely. engine RPM, two or three things. The most important thing is predictive for the circuit racers. We've worked a lot on that, a lot of this is patented. A lot of stuff that's related to this product is patented, so you can go search patents if you want to. Um, it presents all that information, hands off, you don't have to do anything. When you come to a stop, it present, presents a lap time. So. That's kind of what we want to make this uh, hands off, don't touch anything, don't deal with it. Once you pair it up for that day, you're done with it. And then again, the data is waiting on you when you get back, so right. you get out your Android device or your iPad. We run these big Samsung views here, and they're really, really cool, and you've seen that, and you've played around with it. Um, but when you go back from the run, or your outing, or whatever you're doing, the data is waiting on you, sitting there. So Beautiful. there's no memory card, there's no cables to plug in, right. and, and all this stuff that goes with that. And trust me, we've dealt with that for 30 years, so that's what we're trying to get away from, you know, so. And the data's also on the phone. You can use the phone for review, too. It's funny, when we first started working with it, that, you know, people were like, we're not even internally, nobody's gonna use a phone. Well, I use a phone all the time now. I kick it out, look at it, look at my lateral Gs, go, okay, cool, yeah, we missed that corner, that corner. Right. That's all you do, yep. Yeah, I see uh, J. Ken says that's cool. Thank you so much, J. Ken. Oh, hello, Leo, good seeing you as well. And yes, we are at Race Pack Foxman, absolutely. We're out here in beautiful Rancho Santa Margarita. And Tim here is the president here of Race Pack and shares some great insights on the Vantage CL1, which retails for $599, an amazing device which combines the power of mobile technology with data acquisition, which is absolutely fantastic. And you can have both external sensors that you can integrate with the device and also with the engine management OBD2 integrate some of your internal sensors that the ECU looks at, which is pretty nice. Um, race pack versus Motec is what AJ uh, is asking. There, Any uh, thoughts about that, um, Tim? Obviously, there's a difference if you look at, and, and, and I mean, I won't lie about any of this stuff. I've ran Motec in my past life. I've ran Pi systems in my past life. I've 
ran Ames and all that stuff. Everyone is after a different market, and, and our market's a little different than MoTeC. Is there any difference between the two? Uh, data is data. Graphical analysis is graphical analysis. I think MoTeC a lot of times they work at a real, you know, with the, in a pyramid. You know, you have like the the sportsman guys and the middle guys and the guys at the very top, and and some of their their products really appeal to the guys at the very very top. And and that for us, we can work in that world, but we really go for the middle middle customer in that pyramid of, of customers a lot of times. Yeah. Yep. Beautiful. Beautiful. Fox says sounds like magic. It is. Well, it's technology doing its doing its thing is magic, which is pretty exciting. So that being said, wow, we are at the 45 minute mark, which very soon I may get cut off from Instagram. So I promised today to give a very cool gift to someone who can answer a proper question. Um, I see Foxman has a question before I get into my question that can <laughs> allow someone to win a prize. Is the goal to make it so that if a racer doesn't have a race pack, they will fall behind in racing? <laughs> No. It's like trying to make race pack a must have. Well, yes. Well, of course. If you don't have it, <laughs> you're going to lose. It, as I mentioned earlier, and you may have missed this, Foxman, um, it has helped me tremendously become a better racer. It really has. And, be, and the data is so Im impressive that what I saw on my Vantage One feedback was exactly to the millisecond the number that was recorded with my transponder. It was crazy. And I could, at a leisure, my own leisure, at home, at a restaurant afterwards, at a gas station, at the restroom, whatever, um, I have the opportunity to look at what I did properly and what I did improperly. Did I break too soon? Did I go into a corner too hot? Did I come out of the apex too late? What did I do? How is my vehicle reacting in terms of pitch, y'all? What am I doing to become a better driver and this has helped me tremendously for $599 it's given me information that has allowed me to have thousands of dollars worth of benefit and rough fab Sam is correct data is king yes restroom you, absolutely you know the French. best part yes was when you're on the track and I'm watching you here in the office he's watching me and I'm texting Hattie saying <laughs> tell him to drive the thing in further <laughs> that's what I can tell you what the problem is right now so it's and we actually because when you register the box, you set up your team and you can add team members to it. But we're on a lot of teams because we just want to keep an eye on the data and stuff. And and so I'm on his team and I watch his data. And, yeah, and, and he tells me he wasn't further. in the car after that. So. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that was Michael. That yeah. was me. Anyway, um, yes, it is a wonderful prize, absolutely. And Ricardo, thanks for the kind words. Yes, technology and knowledge is on fire today. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Thank you so much, young French. So, for a special prize from Race Pack. I have a very good question, and whoever answers this first will get the prize. We talked a lot about the Vantage today from Race Pack and how it can make us better drivers and give us data that's very, very interesting and very beneficial. What is the model number of the Vantage? What model number? Whoever is the first person to give me that model number will win the prize. So who is it? Let's see. Who's the first person to give you the model number of the Vantage? I know you came in late. I saw you come in, Project. I saw that indeed. And while they're going online and figuring it out, I was going to tell you if you go to race, race Pack at the top and click on Learn More. Oh, or Sam got it. <laughs> Sam got it. <laughs> there you go. So, CO1, Sam got it. No, it's not CO1. Not Vantage 1, but CO. I'm sorry. Rod Fab got it. So, Sam, you won today. It's up to you. Sam is a very seasoned race car driver. He actually gave great input on the vehicle itself and is a wonderful fabricator. He's helped us tremendously with all our builds. He is going, where's he going? He's going to Coda this week. <laughs> He's going to Coda this week. So, so whatever tell nice him, gift. Tell him to email me. Tell okay. Him okay. Sounds good. So, Sam, I'll provide you his email address. Oh, my God. <laughs> Sam, you have a very good pre present. So, I'll, I'll give you Tim's email. Email him, and he has a wonderful present for you. AJ, I'm sorry, it's a little too late. You're correct, but it's a little too late. Maybe I'll provide you a consolation prize. How about that? September at Kodo. Okay, even better. Okay. So that being said, AJ, write to us at sales at bcmo.com. Since you got the correct one, even though you are tardy, we will give you a consolation prize, okay? Maybe I had something. Anyway, okay. So guys, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're getting close to the to the end mark. My pleasure. Sam is saying thank you. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Beautiful. So guys, thank you so much for joining us. I will have this up 
in a few moments on iTunes, Anchor, Radio Public, and then upload later on on YouTube. So again, join the BC Mother YouTube feed. And for those of you on YouTube, thank you very much for viewing with us today. And I'll have this up on Instagram for 24 hours. So our pleasure, Basile. Thank you so much. No, sales in plural. Sales, S-A-L-E-S. -E sales at bcmother.com. And we'll get something to you, okay? Thank you, guys. Thank you, Young. Have a good afternoon and stay tuned. Cheers. Have a great day as well. Same Tim and I. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Take care, guys. Cheers.